Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. It is May 12th, 2024. Let's talk about a few things in boxing, including this Lomachenko uh, Cambrosis fight. But first, remember the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, just some back comments. You know, I actually am into other sports, right? Baseball, football, basketball, uh, a lot of other sports. Yesterday I was watching a UFC show. A guy named Sean Woodson has a lot of skills, right? I'm into other sports, but the reason why I bet on boxing, besides the fact that I love boxing, it's because there's a lack of consensus in boxing that's shocking. So you're getting these skewed lines. I get the feeling many fans of boxing have no idea what's going on. Understand, if I'm following the NBA, even if a guy misses 20 games, he's still playing in 62 games a year against standardized opposition, in other words, the rest of the league. It's not like the guy can say, hey, I'm not going to play Denver, right? I'm not going to play Boston. No, you know, you're playing the teams on your team's schedule. So over time, rather quickly, you're able to see Joel Embiid play 62 games one year, 62 games the next year, 62 games the other year. So after three years, you kind of know how good he is. You and I know that's not the case in boxing. You can be an elite for years. Um, you could come from the same country, just like Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua have. Right? Both of you could have held portions of the heavyweight title just like Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury have and somehow found a way not to make it in the ring for several years. Right? That's the reality of boxing. So yesterday, I thought was striking. Yesterday revealed a lot. Let me just say, I joined the show here in the United States on ESPN late. So when I got to the boxing telecast, two women were in the ring. And one was beating the daylights out of the other one. I thought she clearly had the edge in the fight. I watched something like the last three rounds. As I was watching, the announcers let you know that the woman who they themselves thought were winning the fight was the home country fighter, right? The card was from Australia. Tim Bradley on the telecast said, hey, the title's gonna change hands tonight. In other words, the champ was the one getting beaten up by the challenger. So I watched it and I thought, wow, this is interesting. Right? I wouldn't have guessed who was champ. Then, of course, they had the ring announcer, and this was the first for me. I've seen bad ring announcers, but nothing like this. They had the ring announcer announce the winner of the fight. Apparently, it was a unanimous decision. One judge had it pretty wide. And believe it or not, the guy said that the champ had defended her title. Now, What's fascinating, what's singular about boxing is what happened next. The camera showed the champ waving her hand, her corner was excited. Then it showed the other fighter. Now keep in mind, on one of the cards, that other fighter, who had just been ripped off of her chance at the title, on one judge's card was ahead by four or more rounds. And she just stood in the ring and she nodded, right? You got the feeling her thought process was, this is the life I chose. This is the sport I'm in. She was prepared 
to accept the loss. Then, of course, the ring announcer hurries back in the ring. He had misread the cards, right? Only in boxing do you get this. He had misread the cards. So he reread them. And keep in mind, you didn't know what was going on until he was well into rereading them. And then, of course, we all came to learn that the fighter who actually won the fight by a wide margin was the one who had previously been declared the loser. Now, my point to you is, boxing has taken so many twists and turns that as I was watching it unfold when they initially announced the winner, I thought to myself, wow, the champ must have dominated the first seven rounds. <laughs> maybe, maybe the rounds I missed involved knockdowns and stuff like that. Right then when I saw the apparent loser nodding her head in the ring, I just thought, man, you know, Maybe I'm just missing the boat here. Understand, people in the crowd were upset, but they were prepared to accept the verdict. And the verdict, of course, would have been completely ridiculous. So then, same telecast, <clears throat> they interview a fighter from an earlier fight, a guy named Maloney. He had lost a decision to a guy named Guevara. And understand, Maloney in the interview said boxing was rigged he said my words not his right I'm paraphrasing he said boxing was rigged he said that he thought he won 10 of the 12 rounds right he was so disgusted by the way that apparently he announced his retirement right after the decision was announced so then the guys on ESPN had to confess that they actually had his opponent winning the fight, right? The guy who thought boxing was rigged, who I'm convinced thought he won the fight, thought he won the fight by 10 to 8 rounds, right? Well, now we have the copy box numbers. Understand the guy who was convinced that he won the fight, landed 77 power shots over 12 rounds. The guy who supposedly got the gift decision landed 132 power shots over 12 rounds. In other words, this guy in the fight had no idea what was going on. Thought he was schooling his opponent when that opponent was landing dozens more power shots than he was. Let's talk about another delusional individual. Ryan Garcia, Mr. Osterin, right now wants to fight Errol Spence. Now we'll overlook the fact that it's Spence who hopped in the ring after a fight at 154 pounds who wanted to fight the winner of that fight. In other words, Spence has grown tired of trying to lose weight to make 147. Ryan Garcia even missing weight by more than three pounds, weighed less than 144 pounds for his fight against Devin Haney. Right, so we'll ignore <clears throat> Garcia overlooking the apparent weight gap between himself and Errol Spence. But what we can't ignore is the sizable possibility that Ryan Garcia is going to be suspended for some length of time because he tested positive for Osterin. Right, folks, understand Osterin got Lucien Butte suspended. Why does Ryan Garcia think everyone is going to look the other way after his failed drug test against Devin Haney. Right? I understand the B-side hasn't fully been tested yet. I'm expecting it to come back positive, just like the A-side, because that's what usually happens, right, when you test the B-side. But just understand, Ryan Garcia, 
I'm surprised he's not aware that he could well be suspended multiple years because of his drug infraction if the B-side comes back positive. Now let's talk about the Lomachenko fight and let's pull up a big debate that we had in boxing in the 1980s. There is a great interview here on YouTube of legendary trainer Angelo Dundee. Right, Dundee, of course, was Ali's trainer. <clears throat> Dundee was Jimmy Ellis's trainer. Dundee was Sugar Ray Leonard's trainer. Right? Let's just say Dundee had a few guys who did very well in boxing. Right? Well, they asked Dundee one of the big questions of an era, right? How his guy, Muhammad Ali, <clears throat> would do against Iron Mike Tyson. <clears throat> and Dundee, who was diplomatic, right? He was the older guy who was everyone's friend. Right after being the younger guy, after being the younger guy who was supporting a black Muslim fighter, right? Dundee, this is the gentler, kinder, gentler Dundee in his old age. Dundee pointed out that Mike Tyson moved in straight lines in the ring and that his guy Ali was more fluid right? Wasn't as predictable. Didn't move in straight lines, right? It was clear from the comments <clears throat> that Dundee thought that that by itself justified picking Ali over Tyson, right? Well, what I want people to do is to think about fighters with great legs, right? I'll name three. Lomachenko, he showed that again yesterday. Right? Reports of his demise have been greatly exaggerated. Also, uh, Dimitri Bevel, great legs. Right? Looks like he's floating around the ring. Jaron Ennis, same type thing. You know, it's as if these fighters are on skates. Right? It's just one of these things where you understand that the guy can move, the guy can do things that an opponent might not be able to keep up with. Now, let me just point out that you don't even have to look that long in this fight to figure out that it's a mismatch. I want you to look at the first round, first three minutes of the fight. Now, understand, Cambosis is a very skilled counterpuncher. That's his forte, right? You throw, he leans away, your punch misses him, he comes back, he hits you flush, right? He's not a Tyson. He's not a front foot heavy guy who's coming to find you. Even though he's physically the bigger man than Lomachenko, you knew this isn't a George Foreman type who is going to hunt you down. By the way, when Foreman came back, I believe he was trained by Angelo Dundee for a stretch. Double check me on that one. But you know the big guy who's going to come looking for you? Nigel Benn. Right? The slugger who wants a shootout. That's not Cambosis. So you knew going into this fight, whatever the size is, you knew Cambosis was going to try to have some skill contest against Lomachenko, right? So you find out in that first round that what Cambosis wants to do is to counter Lomachenko to his body, right? Just look at the first round. So Cambosis either wants to parry a Lomachenko shot, then hit him in the body, or he wants to find Loma as Loma tries to leave an exchange. He wants to end that exchange with a body shot. So, of course, here he is against Loma. Loma is moving around the ring, right? Loma has lateral movement. 
which is very different than just jumping back, right? Loma has lateral movement. So Loma is circling him in a sense. So Cambosis is waiting for the exchange. Loma comes in. Loma has the faster hands, right? Loma is a guy who faints. Understand, he does not have to faint his upper body. This is a guy with great knees. This is a guy who can do leg feints. In other words, Loma bends his leg suddenly. You think a punch is coming. You start to cover up. Right? Then Loma has an opportunity to hit you while you're covering up. In other words, Loma is setting you up with feints. It's like he's counterpunching a fighter who hasn't thrown a punch. Well, understand what happens early. This is early. Loma's in there trying to figure out the lay of the land. Loma's fainting. Cambosis is falling for the faints. Loma then starts to get some courage and starts to be on his front foot. Understand, Loma has a front foot. Don't confuse Loma with a guy who doesn't have a punch and doesn't have a front foot. When we called Loma no mas earlier in his career, understand he's in front of punchers like Nicholas Walters who end up quitting against him. So Loma, of course, is on his front foot and while Loma is on his front foot, Cambosis tries to hit him in the body. After Cambosis lands a couple of body shots in that first round, Loma starts dodging the body shots while he initially was on his front foot. Folks, once you see it, once you realize that Loma can do this several times in the same round, once you see a guy who can just jump back on demand, in other words, he has the legs, he has the reflexes, he has the coordination in his mid-30s. Once you realize that Loma had Cambosis timed in the first round, to avoid getting hit in the body, you understood this fight was over. You understood Cambosis couldn't even land body shots. It's tough enough trying to hit Loma in the head, right? Because Loma has upper body movement. If you can't hit him in the head and you can't hit him in the body and you're falling for his feints, if you're a fan, you need to look at your watch because you need to understand this match is over. Cambosis is on the clock. It's only a question of whether he gets stopped or whether he loses by decision. Right early in this fight, you understood. Cambosis needed a knockout because he was not going to win the rounds on the scorecard in his backyard. Right? This is that jaw-dropping performance. I thought Loma looked spectacular. Right? Let me point out too. Loma made a mistake when he fought Teofimo Lopez. Right? Loma is on his back foot early in that fight. As I've said here before, he should have tilted Teofimo backwards. He should have been coming forward on Teofimo like he was here against Cambosis. Instead, he let Teofimo be on his front foot. He let Teofimo grow some hair on his chest. Then when he tried to come back late against Teofimo, it was too late. Devin Haney, another younger man, right? Loma makes the mistake. Same mistake Golovkin makes in his last fight against Canelo where he decides he's going to survive the first six rounds, right? He lets Devin Haney drive the car. He's in the ring. He's going to force Haney to work, but he himself is not going to be aggressive. He himself is not going to be offensive because he feels the younger guy has a younger man's stamina. 
by fighting that fight as an old man, when Loma makes his run in the second half of the fight, and we can debate it, I, under, I understand there's a whole crowd of you out there who feel Loma won that fight. But when he makes his run, it's a little bit too late. By the time you get to the 12th round, while Loma has come back in the fight, you understood he needed that 12th round to have a credible chance of beating Haney. In my opinion, he did not get that 12th round. If you're looking at fights at 135 that are meaningful over the last five years, Haney Lomachenko is one of those fights. We'll be talking about that fight for years, but understand, the Loma in that fight is not the Loma in this Cambosis fight. This Loma comes out, Cambosis isn't as young as Devin Haney. Loma apparently did not feel that he needed to save his stamina against Cambosis like he did Devin Haney. Right, so Loma takes over from early. You get to the third round and Loma's so comfortable here that he starts throwing his signature straight left up top. Cambosis can't block it because Loma is simply too fast. And of course, Loma, because of the leg feints, because of the ability to just, you know, have quick twitch reflexes, as well as to be truly ambidextrous. Cambosis doesn't know when Loma's going to throw that straight left. And it was landing with regularity, right, from a southpaw. By the third round, you see the full Loma game. You knew it was over when you saw Loma dodging body shots in the first round. Right, the rest of the fight is academic. It's Loma just continuing to dishearten Cambosis. It's Timothy Bradley on the telecast saying, hey, drive-in boxing does not matter unless you have the skills. Skills pay the bills. Right, you could be the bigger man. If you aren't the more skilled man, you're going to have problems. Right? My words paraphrasing Timothy Bradley's sentiments. Right? So Loma wins this fight going away. Let me point out that the moment of the stoppage is riveting. Right? I'll never forget Diego Corrales' father throwing in the towel from the corner in a Diego Corrales fight. I think he was fighting Mayweather. Double check me on that. Here, there were a few people in Cambosis's corner. Right? Cambosis is getting hammered. Cambosis goes to the canvas. Cambosis gets off the canvas. Loma, and you need to look at the last round carefully because that's who Loma really is. Loma runs over with one intention. He's already won the fight on the scorecards. It's Claire Cambosis, who's cut over an eye, isn't going to be able to resurrect himself to knock out Loma, right? Loma, for all intents and purposes, has already won the fight. That's not enough. He runs over. He wants a stoppage. So, of course, he drills Cambosis. Then the towel comes in from Cambosis's corner. It's Cambosis's father who throws in the towel in a fight that took place in Cambosis's backyard of Australia. Folks, it's a goosebump moment. Right? You see Loma and you realize, okay, boxing media has got to do a better job. <laughs> Right, the last few weeks we were hearing Canelo's on his last leg. We're past peak Canelo. Right, now you're looking at Loma and you're saying, wow, they're saying this guy might be on his way down? <laughs> this guy who 
completely dominated Cambosis, in my opinion, from the opening bell. Right? Let me just add a couple of things. And let's now talk about the lightweight division in general. Right? You have a huge fight coming up. Folks, it's one of the biggest fights in the entire sport. It's Frank Martin's challenge of Gervonta Davis. Now, I don't know about you, but I thought the Isaac Cruz Gervonta Davis fight was troubling because it seemed to me that Cruz was able to move behind Gervonta Davis. It seemed that Davis could not keep Cruz in front of him. Right? It seemed to me that Cruz did better than we remember. Revisit that fight. Cruz, an unknown fighter, going into that fight against Gervonta Davis. I thought he gave Davis all Davis could handle. Let's remember that fight goes 12 rounds, right? That fight is the opposite of the Ryan Garcia fight. Right there you had a challenger who literally seemed to have the mindset of, hey, Gervonta, you're really going to have to hurt me. And I'm really going to have to get counted out for this fight to end prematurely. Right? That fight hung in the balance all the way through the announcement of the winner. So now you're telling me that a mobile, an agile Frank Martin, who, by the way, would be an excellent opponent for Vasily Lomachenko, you're telling me that Frank Martin is about to fight Gervonta Davis. I have no doubt Davis is hoping to land some big shots. Right? But is he even going to be looking in the right direction? Because we know Martin is not going to stay in front of him. We know Martin is going to force Davis to turn. Right? I've made a premium video on that fight. Just understand, I think that's a huge matchup. So let's talk about some other matchups here. Right? Navarate. I'll say this. He's a knockout puncher, but he hasn't been at 135 that long. Understand, too, you saw the speed, and it was fast. You saw the speed at which Lomachenko fought Cambosis. Right, folks, those feints drain an opponent. Right, when a guy has legs like this, where he's off at the side over here, and you look, then he's back in front of you, and he's throwing straight lefts. Right, you don't even know where he is. His lateral movement is just too much. You try to hit him in the body, you can't even hit him in the body. He's almost impossible to counter. You know, he's fighting tall, then he's fighting mid-range. You know, he can change the height at which he fights. Folks, that's a lot. Now, you're telling me that an unorthodox guy, and the flaws do make the diamond, but you're telling me that Navarate, who's unorthodox, whose feet are sometimes together, who sometimes have the has the wrong foot in front of him, you're telling me that an unorthodox guy is going to be able to handle the speed at which Lomachenko, even in his mid-30s, fights. I have my doubts about that. Right? Let's just say a Navarrete versus Lomachenko fight, I think, favors the fighter who can fight faster, who doesn't make mistakes in terms of not being able to get leverage on his shots. Right? Let's mention someone who needs to be mentioned. By the way, he's about to challenge boxing orthodoxy. And that's Shakur Stevenson. Now let's be clear here. I think there's a title that Stevenson can just walk in the room and pick up. It's Teofimo Lopez's title at 140 pounds. Let me make a couple of points here. You don't have to gain weight 
to fight a guy for his title. I can weigh 135, 137. This is something Manny Pacquiao used to do for fights. I could weigh 137, whatever, for a fight at 140. Right? I'm not going to get hurt if you can't find me in the ring. Who are the types of fighters who give Teofimo Lopez problems? Sander Martin, Southpaw, could fight from distance, back foot. Jermaine Ortiz, who wasn't even a Southpaw, decides to fight Southpaw. An argument can be made that he beat Teofimo. Right? Timothy Bradley's not convinced. Top Rank's in house analyst is not convinced that top top ranks Teofimo Lopez won that fight. Let me just say too, you saw Regis Progre unable, simply unable, to handle Devin Haney's movement and speed. Let's remember there was a knockdown in that fight. Right? Haney got the knockdown, not Progre. Now, Progre is still one of the kings of the hill at 140, right? How would Progre deal with Shakur Stevenson's speed? Now, Stevenson is one of these guys who, you know, I know what I have to say sounds ridiculous. It, you know, <laughs> people still tease me over the fact that I feel Canelo would have a shot on Deontay Wilder, right? People tease me about that. We'll overlook the fact that Frank Sanchez would almost certainly have a shot on uh, Deontay Wilder. And, of course, Frank Sanchez's sparring partner was Canelo, right? Canelo's a guy who, behind the scenes, is sparring with heavyweights. Canelo's a guy who himself beat Kovalev and was a champ at 175, right? I thought this was a sport where a Bob Fitzsimmons, a Michael Spinks, didn't Spinks jump from light heavyweight? A Roy Jones could jump from light heavyweight and become heavyweight champion. I thought this was a sport where a guy who was not even the champion at light heavyweight, Ezra Charles, kills a man Believe that he hit too hard. I'm not kidding. Believe that he hit too hard at 175. Goes up to heavyweight. Ends up fighting Joe Lewis. And beats him. Right, folks. Canelo's so hard to hit. You saw Joe Parker give Deontay Wilder all he can handle. You know, Park, uh, you know Wilder knocks guys out with headshots. Right? Aren't most of Wilder's KO's headshots? He's not hitting guys in the body who then look like they're shot. And good luck finding Canelo's body. If Canelo comes in fighting low, Canelo defensively blessed. If Canelo knows that you're going to try to hit him in the head, how are you going to do so? Right? Well, let me just say... Shakur Stevenson is so fast. He's a southpaw too. So if he were to fight Matthias at 140, I know Matthias has that hellacious left hook. Think about how it lines up. It lines up with Shakur Stevenson's non-dominant hand because Shakur's a southpaw. Shakur would be able to fight like this. He'd be able to have a guard up against Matthias He'd be able to take away that left hook. What's going to stop a Shakur Stevenson straight left? Right, so keep an eye on Shakur Stevenson. I know there's a lot of politics on in the background, right? Shakur's contract is running out. Uh, it's with top rank. Uh, Lomachenko's with top rank. There seems to be a setup here where Loma is supposed to fight the winner of the Navarrete fight, right? Just understand, if Shakur Stevenson decides to be a nomad, if Shakur Stevenson decides that 
he's not tethered to 135 pounds, right? All of us need to realize that against certain opponents, Teofimo Lopez comes to mind, right? Whoever the winner is of the Josh Taylor upcoming fight, right? Stevenson would give all of them problems, right? Stevenson is one of the few people in the sport who I feel is just too fresh and too young for Lomachenko, right? Stevenson, of course, wants to fight Loma. He wants to fight Tank. Uh, of course, Tank was sending tweets during the fight, the lomachenko Cambosis fight, and Tank said, hey, I got Frank Martin next, then after that I'll fight Loma. Right? If Stevenson feels that he's being left out at 135, just understand, he would be awfully dangerous at 140. Right? Just understand, too, the statements I'm making about Matthias's left hook, I could easily be making about Ryan Garcia's left hook. Right? Stevenson, a southpaw, would be able to block left hooks with his non-dominant hand. Understand, too, Stevenson has an excellent jab. Right? He's going to give guys with left hooks problems, especially since he's more mobile than a Ryan Garcia. So those are just my preliminary thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Make no mistake, Lomachenko is in the center of the universe at 135. Right? Let's watch this Frank Martin, Gravante Davis fight closely. If Davis has a hard time keeping Frank Martin in front of him, if Davis is able to survive that fight, how do we know that he won't have a hard time keeping Lomachenko in front of him? Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.